Before we get started with this episode of the Josh Terry Podcast, we want to thank all of our sponsors, Blazer 88, Project K9 Hero, Lori's Dive-In, 601 Roofing King, Down Yonder Hat Co., Cottonfield Grill, Cashman's Pub, Better Than Basic Marketing, Middle Georgia Total Health, Nobles Dirt Works, Nobles Networking, Mischief Media, Yankee Paradise South, Web Space Today, and 22 Sierra Coffee. Now, let's get into the episode, y'all. What's up, folks? Thank y'all for tuning into the Josh Terry Podcast. Uh, I'm excited, y'all. Uh, I get excited about certain shows. I get excited about meeting new people, uh, especially like this stuff you don't see happening. Um, a couple of months ago in Nashville, uh, I was minding my own business at Live Oak. I was at a, a writer's round. It wasn't mine. And uh, one of my buddies was like, hey, you want to meet somebody really cool? And I was like, I always want to meet somebody cool. And uh, <laughs> I'm not going to lie to y'all. This guy probably hates being referred to this because he's so much more than this. Uh, I really like him for everything else he does. But they're like, you want to meet the kid from Ricky Bobby, the spider monkey kid? And I was like, why the fuck wouldn't I want to meet the spider monkey kid? <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Grayson Russell, what is up, dude? <laughs> What's going on, Josh? How y'all doing, everybody? Man, you know what? I hate introducing you that way because like no, I've got, no, I've got to know, bother me at all. I've got to know you a little bit now. And uh this is what's funny. Uh a couple things is gonna be funny. I'm gonna tell you in a minute that you don't know. But what's funny is I told my daughter that, and my daughter loves Ricky Bobby anyway. Um uh, and I and like I know it's Talladega Nights, but everybody around here calls it Ricky Bobby. I think most people call it yeah. Ricky Bobby anyway. But she was like, you know, he was in Diary of the Wimpy Kid. And I was like, I didn't know that. Like, I don't even remember you telling me that the first night. And I, yeah. me and her used to watch that all the time too. So that's two things now that I know that I've seen you in. So it's really cool for me anyway. But I've got to hear you play some music now and some of the stuff you wrote. And that's what really made me gravitate towards you and made me actually like you. You could have, you could have been in those movies and I could have liked you for that. But me having the personality that I have, if you would have sucked at music, <laughs> I, I probably would have just been like, "Why the fuck is this guy trying to do this?" <laughs> yeah. Like he should have, he should have just done. And I know you're still doing movies and everything, but I, I would have been like, "Why is that guy not staying in his lane?" I like what you do. I, I really do. I hope more people actually pay attention to your your music career and what you're trying to do than just you know pay attention to what you did as a kid and your movies you're doing now. Yes, sir. Well, I'll tell you this, uh, the, this past weekend I was on a run playing up in Kentucky and, uh, the bus broke down at about two o'clock in the morning in Bowling Green. And I was up under it from two to about four thirty, trying to patch this, this coolant coupling that had exploded and blew antifreeze all over the place. It was at that point that I was like, you know what? Acting ain't so bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, I've got, I've got, I've got to post it. There's literally, I'm, I'm, my hair is soaked in a just a whole big pool of antifreeze. I'm up there, I'm like, you know what? It's times like these, we're, we're staying in my film lane. <laughs> hey, don't, hey, don't, don't feel so bad after all. <laughs> that tickles the shit out of me. Uh, yeah. it, yeah, actually, it actually brings me the other thing I was going to give you shit about. Um, so. Last weekend, or was it the weekend before? I guess it would have been the weekend before last. I was in Alabama, and I was in Alabama yeah. with Brian Martin and Court Taylor. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they start arguing on the golf course. Like, we're all having a really good time on the golf course and everything. We're all bullshitting. It's them, Will Mosley, 
Jason, Michael, Carol, Benji, Taylor. We're all just having a great damn time. Uh, thanks to the folks from Cottonfield uh, Grill, Mr. Kevin and his family and Ty and everybody for putting us up all weekend. It was just a, a great time. But uh, they're arguing, and I'm like, what are y'all arguing about? And I guess one of them had said, they started talking about you, and they were like, yeah, he really likes me. He gave me a key to his house and said I could come stay anytime I want to. And the other one got pissed because I guess you had told them, yeah, I got a key to his house too. I could stay whenever I want to. And they were arguing back and forth about who you like more. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I was over there and I was like, well, he ain't been around him twice. He ain't gave me no key. So I guess I'm just the least favorite <laughs> anyway. So who gives a damn? Like, but it was just, it was, it tickled me watching Court Taylor and Brian Martin just fight over who you like more. It just, it, it tickled the shit out of me. Well, they're both, they're both precious. I met, um, I met Courtney, uh, actually Courtney and Brian at the, at that same round. Yeah. Um, which, which was, which was Skinny's. So it was Skinny Shit Show at Live Oak. And, um, uh, dude, I owe, I owe just about all of it to, to Skinny, man. That dude has, has taken me in here in town being, I mean, I've, I've been here officially only about five months, but I, I would come over here twice a month for the past two, three years to hop on the bus. And cause I play utility for a guy who won a couple of Grammys back. And I was coming from Chattanooga, man. I got tired of doing that. And there's a film studio here. So my whole life kind of started to consolidate the Nashville. Um, but Skinny was so gracious to start bringing me around, you know, venues that I'd only ever wanted to play for the past, you know, two, three years. Like, okay, that's what I want to do and where I want to be. And then, then just on top of that, everybody ends up being such tremendous individuals. Um, Courtney brought me on to, to her, to one of her rounds later. I think Brian played the round after that. Um, but yeah, they're both, they're both really precious folks. I told, uh, Brian, we were, we were out over at Red Door one night. Till, till it closed and he's like all right i'm gonna head home i was like dude where do you live he's like oh i'm about i think he's like, almost like two hours south yeah it's, it's, a, like, it's a good dude, dude i live on west end i am eight minutes from losers y'all just come over here and so it's like all right so it was me and his buddy burn big old black fellow named burn burn's yeah. the man he's precious and we sat here and wrote for like three hours we i think we all went to bed at like nine that next morning yeah, and, uh, Brian well, Martin's notorious for keeping us awake till the sun comes up writing songs. Uh, yeah, he's, dude, he's like he's like he's like Rain Man, dude. You like he has a gift for songwriting. Yeah, yeah uh, yeah. he's one of my best friends, man. I think the world of him. Um, he's just he's a special individual. There's not many people that talk in song. He yeah. he don't know how to not speak in lyrics, man. And I I've never. I hadn't been around many people that's like that. And yeah, that, that's, that, that's just their being. That, that's yeah. who they are outside of. It just so happens that, that their occupation is, is central to, to who they are. Yeah. You know, for, for me, like, like acting, I got to study that. I got to yeah. figure out who this person is. I got to become that when I'm doing my music. It's don't get me wrong. It's me in the, in the performance, but it's, but it's far more, um, technical in in the way i write and the things that i write for him it just it just it just is brian you yeah. know you look in the you look in the bible and the good lord's like i am who i am it's <laughs> brian it's just like this is yeah this brian. is it just coming out of there and i told him i was like look dude you're out till red door three door all the time or whenever you're in town there ain't no sense in driving an hour half the time i'm not even gonna be here i gotta go do a tv tv show for three months dude here's a damn house key man yeah just <laughs> anytime you need it and uh i told uh you know i'm, I'm thinking it was a couple of weeks later court me and uh uh Bryce and cooper and um cam and a couple of their buddies were over here late one night and i was like yeah we need to stay here let me know I, I actually i don't know i'm out of spare house keys right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh but no dude that's the thing like i'm in I'm an only child. I've always liked being having folks around. I'm a you know recovering college student. So I'm used to having people in here. So I like I like having my space by myself, but also it's like, you know, it can be used for stuff better than just me sitting around. Well, that's cool. That's, that's cool. That's funny. That's funny. She had she had uh she had told me that they'd gotten a fight. They'd gotten a fight over me, but I didn't know what the what the context was. was so that's funny. hilarious. Yeah, we uh see like with our group, we we kind of take pride in it that we ain't friends, we're family. 
Like we yeah. don't, and it's, we all bicker with each other about the dumbest shit. We don't ever get yeah. no like real squabbles. We don't ever yeah. get in like no real serious arguments. And so yeah. it's like when one of us can one up the other one about something, we're going to take a shot where we can. Yeah. And, and that day, boy, Brian Martin, he had done, he done let loose that day on the golf course everywhere. He was given, he was giving Will Mosley shit about coming in second on American Idol anyway. <laughs> like, I, I, I mean, he was just giving Will the utmost hell you had ever heard. <laughs> and it was wonderful. Like, I'm talking, I, we, cried. <laughs> we cried all day as much as – Brian is – good a songwriter he is if he don't if he don't make it in music he could be a comedian as as dark as he is and as much as he's willing to yeah. hurt your feelings but he gave yeah. real shit all day but he he was take jabs at courtney about the keys he take jabs at me about the podcast he he would just take jabs everywhere he could but that's what we do and um hell dude you it's like because little skinny's family does too like we love him to death yeah. And when he brought you and introduced you to all of us and everything, you fit right in. Hey, you hell, you felt you felt like family since the first second we met you. Well, I appreciate that, John. And it, it, it's cool because it's gotten to where now, um, and the good Lord, I, I think, has really played a big part in you know making Nashville feel like home. Uh, because it's it's gotten to a point where, dude, I'll run into somebody I know now in Planet Fitness. You know, just <laughs> just you, you're random. Um, it feels like uh, it feels like home. I grew up in Clanton, Alabama, where I, where I grew up. It's got nine thousand people in it. You do not go to Walmart. You do not go to Waterburger. You don't go to Main Street Cafe without running into at least one person. You go to Main Street, there's going to be about fifteen or twenty, and it's going to take you fifteen minutes to socialize before you even sit down. Yeah. Um, and so it's 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 cool that it's only taken it really. Uh, only took about two, three months of being here to 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 form um, you know those kind of relationships. It made this place feel home, you know, and somewhere I thought, man, if it's gonna take me, you know, this long to get this all figured out and not that I have it all figured out, but it's just um How'd you get hooked up with Skinny in the first place? Because that's about the best I give him I give him hell all the time about being the best name dropper in Nashville, but he's about the most loved son of a bitch I've ever met. Absolutely. Abs there's not, there's absolutely. not nobody like he <clears throat> thinks he thinks most of the time that I hate him. And it ain't that I hate him. He's like the little brother that's so damn annoying, yeah. but you love him to death. You'd fight every son of a bitch in the world for him. Yeah. Like he gets on yeah, my, well, well, he gets on my nerves, but I get on my damn nerves. I don't think he realizes that. Well, I mean skinny. Look at skinny, I do, and this is and, and this is, and I, don't, I don't really think it's a stretch. I look at skinny the same way. Um, you, you look at somebody like Austin Post, like Post Malone. Yeah, he's has he's as humble as he can be. Yeah, you can't throw rocks at that. You can't no. throw rocks at the man. And then you'd assume that all right, well, and eh, he's nice. He's probably just in here because he's nice, and he's just gonna be okay. And then you watch him get up there. And play Meredith like you got him to Whoa, do. Shit. And it's just like, my God. Yeah, and it's just, it's, it, it's like somebody, you know, you look at them growing up, you either had kids that were musicians or you had kids that were athletes, but you didn't have kids that were both. Yeah. You would have one or two, and you just about absolutely hate that individual because they were the best at, at both of them. And, uh, and skinny somebody, man, that I, I, hate playing rounds with because it's just like my and i'll and i'll bring him on everything that i can dude yeah and and uh skinny skinny's my best friend here for sh for sure yeah um when it has nothing to do with the fact that uh you know of how of how well he plays um he's just good human yeah um and uh and he, he hangs out with me and my film buddies a couple times a month he fits right in does his thing um but i met skinny through uh uh, Tyler Tritt. Um, okay. So Tyler Reese, um, I was uh went and watched her play at Tin Roof, which is one of the uh, first shows I went to moving into town because uh, I knew her. I'd, I'd never met her, but we had uh, we'd followed each other, me and her, and then uh then uh, her brother Tristan and uh, Skinny's tight with all them, and so I just kind of met Skinny there. Um, 
and went and saw him because uh, we played the thing at CMA Fest and then uh, kind of during all that craziness, um, he had a thing over at, uh, at Greenlock. And so uh, back before he lost the hat and uh, went and went and watched men and we just kind of connected. That's who I run with for the most part. Yeah, you about, you about lucky because uh, I'm telling you, I ain't never in my You're life. Met, lucky. I ain't never in my life met somebody. And it, it's hard to say that he – Dude, he's just like you said. He's humble as hell. He's good at what he does, but he's just such a genuine ass person that any connection that he makes with people is sincere. Like you know that he's yeah. not he's not befriending a Post Malone or a, a John Daly or somebody for the wrong reasons. He's befriending them, yeah. and they are befriending him because hell, they like being around him. He's just he's just family to them. That's what he is to me. I feel like I give him more shit than anybody on the planet. I don't know if anybody else gives him shit, to be honest with you. Yeah, I was I was with I was with Post two nights ago over at Roberts, and yep. the first thing we did was was FaceTime skin. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> do, you, do you know the him story? And, uh, him and Braveheart. Him and do Jason you know the Braveheart. story between me and Post Malone? No. no. Okay, so Post Malone don't don't know, Post Malone don't know this either. So last year during the CMAs, it was November of last year, so it's almost a year ago. Uh I love Post Malone, by the way. I've always just thought the damn world of him. Um, it's even where uh, I made some a post the other day because I was kind of against like Beyonce or some other folks doing country music. I've never been against Post Malone doing it because I think he's doing it his own way and he's doing it a sincere way and it's a cool ass way to where he's sh he's showing like homage. He's paying homage to yeah. to country music, right? Well, last year during the CMAs we got invited to a private party over at losers. Well, somehow he didn't put a card on file. And I imagine he had an entourage with him is what I was told. Yeah. And all his stuff got put on my tab because my stuff is under raising grace studios. Like that's what our debit yeah. card is. And anyway, so at the end of the night, I cashed out on my tab. Well, for some reason they opened up a second tab or whatever. And all his stuff got put on it. And I never met him, never got a chance to see him or the group he was with or whatever. Well, it, my car got closed out again with all his stuff on the tab. It was four or $500 plus whatever tip they left. I don't know what it was. But the next day, me and Will Mosley were headed to Alabama. And when we were headed to Alabama, I've got two different debit cards. And I went to go pay uh, with our studio card and not my personal one for gas. And my car got declined. And I was like, I was like, you know, I don't keep a lot of money in this account anyway, but this is like just for taxes and shit for yeah. business expenses. Like why my car get declined? And I called the bank and they were like, well, there's a big charge on here from losers. And I was like, well, no, I know what I spent there last night. What's this other one? Well, anyway, I called losers and me and Will Mosley recorded the conversation and it was me and their GM and we were laughing about it because he tells the whole story about what happened. Now, Losers was absolutely wonderful. They say that it was yeah. Post Malone's tab. They tell exactly what happened. They didn't put a card on file because it's fucking Post Malone. He's going to pay his tab at yeah. the end of the night. It was just a, yeah. a complete, honest misunderstanding all yeah. the way around. Well, anyway, I posted it on TikTok because I'm a Post Malone fan. Losers had already said it was a complete accident. They were going to refund me. And so, like, who, if you're a Post Malone fan, why wouldn't you post that on social media and be like, hey, Posty, next time, you know, at least let me get a picture and introduce myself if I'm going to get the beer. But it wasn't like anything mean or anything like that. It yeah. was it was a tip of the hat to him to say, like, hey, man. Yeah. Well, anyway, Whiskey Rift and a couple other publications picked it up, and it kind of went a little yeah. bit viral. Yeah. Well, well, anyway, losers, it took them like three months to do this, but losers banned me for life for posting it, but it took them three months. I went in there three, I went in there, I didn't know how much money I'd spent going back in there. Just one night I was in there having fun with my friends and the security guard asked me to walk outside and told me I couldn't come back in. I can't ever go back. I'm banned for life for posting that video. And uh, if you go look on, if you type in Josh Terry and whiskey, what Josh Terry post Malone whiskey riff, and the article still comes up and it says how a professional uh, podcaster picks up post Malone's tab 
in Nashville, and it still showed the video and everything, all that good shit. And uh, I won't post you to see it. I just, I don't, hell, I just want to shake his hand. I just want to meet the fella. Yeah. I, I got my money back. He didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. Losers was cool as hell about it. Like when it first happened, I don't know who got butt hurt there or whatever about it, but it's, it's, I can't ever go back there. I, I don't, uh, there, I don't, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Well, what, that's what I mean. I mean, and, and I don't, and I don't know, I don't know the, the admin side of it. Um, but, a handful of people I met work there and had been nothing but kind of me and gracious, no different than, than post or skinny would be, frankly. Yeah. Well, um, that's what they've always been just as nice as they could be to me too. Hell the, the GM that called me and worked it out. I still got the video on my phone where he's laughing and cutting up and just being as cool as he could damn be about it. I just, I don't know who got rubbed wrong by the video or, or whatever. And like all of my friends, like that's, what's crazy is uh like all of my good friends go there and uh a lot of my best friends play there and it's like damn and it's like you know what if nothing else i might be banned for life out there but you know what i want to have one beer with post this one time tell him about it send him the article and just be like you know what man it'd be worth it it'd be worth it just say hey to you one time it'd be worth it just get a picture with you one time boss can't ever go back into one of my favorite bars but fuck it it'll be okay <laughs> but uh no that's cool i saw i've seen videos of you and skinny hanging out around him and some of the other stuff you've got to do with him it's just uh but you've got to do a lot of cool shit you said that you come from like a uh a little town too right like nine thousand people how'd you yeah. get into acting yeah, in the no. first place oh i didn't mean to at all i want to be george straight and ride bulls that's what i wanted to do as a as a as a child when i was two the the first memory that i that i have um is I was two years old. My folks, we didn't we didn't go on vacations a ton, but but Clanton's dead in the middle of the state of Alabama. So we would we would either go to the Gulf Shores or we'd go to Nashville. And so I, I remember I was two years old and we come up to the Opry and it was the 75th anniversary of the Opry. And the only reason I remember it being that young is because Old Crow Medicine Show was playing the door and I wanted to be George Strait. I'd introduce myself because I started talking early. I'm, my name's Grayson Call Russell George Strait. Cause I'd seen the pure country yeah, and there was that little kid singing heartland on the, the oh, album. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in my mind, I was like, Oh, well, well, if that little kid can, can sing George Strait, then well, so can I. And I, I remember, you know, dressing to the nines. I had my black jeans on and my, my black boots with the little silver tips on them. And the old crow medicine show was playing the door of the Opry and I got there and started dancing and they pointed and laughed at me because they thought it was cute. But I thought they were laughing at me and I got embarrassed. And so the only thing I remember from it is kind of sulking up, drawing up and looking down at my boots because I was embarrassed. I think it's probably the first time I'd ever really been embarrassed as a, you know, as a kid in my life because people were pointing and laughing at me, not realizing, you know, that they thought it was cute. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, the first memory I have is being at the Opry. Um, but Clanton is a is a, a really small town. All my mom's folks up until maybe about two years ago lived on the same road. Yeah, it really the same hillside. My granddad is the youngest of uh, was the youngest of six, and so all the brothers and sisters all kind of lived in the same hillside. And so their kids and grandkids kind of all right there too. Um, and so they'd keep me, uh, you know, when my folks would go to work for our school. But I didn't mean to be an actor. I want to be door straight. I want to ride bulls. And so I started mutton busting, started riding sheep. Okay. So I was at, I was at PBR the other day, Sunday, uh, when it was in town. And um, when I was six, uh, I started doing commercials for this uh, like local car dealership. But they'd use like the cheer squad. You know, like it wasn't a real prestigious deal. I'd get me a little Game Boy game out of it. We're good to go. And uh, my mom's an accountant. She's a partner in the firm. She started co oping in in high school. And this woman, one of her clients, came in with this newspaper and said, hey, there's this Will Ferrell movie they're having auditions for up in Birmingham. You think you should take Grayson? And the only reason we went was because Dad went fishing and we were bored. That was it. That's the only, that's the only reason we went. When I was little, Dad, uh, Dad tournament fished or, or, or tried tournament fish as much as he could. Um, and, uh, yeah, Daddy was fishing. If he hadn't been, we'd been doing something else. 
<laughs> but I never auditioned for. I could I couldn't hardly read. Yeah, you know, I hadn't started the second grade yet. You know, I could do like C spot run, cat in a hat, you know, yeah. that's, that's it. And uh went in, auditioned. Um and about two weeks later they called mom, called mom in her office and was like, Hey, we want you to come back for another audition for how they got. And at that point they were like, Oh, this might be like a real movie. Like we were ignorant to the fact that to, to anything that's going on. Um because <laughs> it's funny talking about American Idol with uh, with Will. I remember standing out in line at that first audition. There's about two, three thousand kids there, and oh, Taylor shit. Hicks had just been Taylor Hicks had just been on American Idol. And in my mind, I was like, man, this must be what a line's like to go to a Taylor Hicks concert. I remember saying that. You remember weird stuff when you live? Yeah. But um, we uh, the callback audition was in Charlotte, and my folks were like, well, he ain't gonna get it. But you know. Well, uh, the baby ain't never been to Six Flags, so we'll just come back through Atlanta. We'll come back through Six Flags. And I remember Six Flags more than I remember the actual audition. Um, <laughs> but we got there, and instead of 2,000 kids, there was 30. And um, it ended up they had already cast me. I didn't know that. And when we went into audition, I was in there for like an hour and a half, and they just cycled the other 29 kids through because they were trying to match me to a brother. Oh, um, shit. I, I want to say that I want to say that audition is on, uh, is on YouTube somewhere i'm wearing like a baby blue polo and uh a couple weeks later they called and said hey he got it come to charlotte for two and a half months and i worked i worked 55 days and we'll work 56 so we spent most of it in charlotte and then uh we spent a week in talladega at raceway dude that's cool yeah and a lot of people i don't know i don't know if i've ever said this on the podcast before but talladega nights was not the title it was um my script is for a uh, high, wide, and handsome. High, wide, and handsome. Called. High, wide, and handsome. And then I want to say for a minute it was red, white, and racing. But all the pictures you see of us like sitting in our chairs, you know, whatever the backs of them that say, they say high, wide, and handsome. On they don't say Talladega Nights. Talladega Nights was it was a uh, was a uh, yeah. I don't think that was the title until probably four or five months after we had finished filming it. Boy, I'm glad somebody changed it. That high, wide, and handsome. Yeah, I'm gl- fucking work. Yeah, it wouldn't work. Not not like Talladega Nights. Yeah, man, that was no nah, Talladega Nights yeah. is hits. Yeah, yes, sir. How how well, okay? So like, I've always wondered this as a child actor. Like some of those lines, I don't know if I could have kept a straight face as an adult. Like that. Oh, they could. They could. They couldn't either. <laughs> they 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 couldn't I, either. The only reason the only reason I was able to pull it off was because I was ignorant. I had no idea what was going on, and I didn't know who anybody was. Elf had just come out. That was, that was about it. You know, I'd never seen Anchorman, and Saturday Night Live was past my bedtime. So my saving grace is all the good. I mean, I got saved doing that movie. My saving grace was not knowing who Will Ferrell any really of was. these people, who any of these people was. were. Yeah, and and like, I remember I had a bunch of, uh, like I had a bunch of language in there that I didn't want to do. I was seven, and growing up in church, I had no... I, I knew better than that. You know, I don't want to do that. And my folks didn't know what to do because they couldn't deny the fact that, all right, the good Lord's put me up right up in the middle of this because this wasn't something we was even trying to do. And um, I remember going up to Adam, who was the big, uh, he was, he was, the, he was the director. He was probably like six, four, uh, the tiny little thing. Cause you only hear about like horror stories with child actors. Sure. And, uh, and I went up to him. I was like, "Hey, Mr. Adam, do I really have to say all this?" And that man sat up and he got up. All, he was he was taking a nap. He sat up and looked me in the eyes. He said, "You never have to say anything. You're not coming. You never have to do anything." That's cool. And for the rest of that, for the rest of that, because objectively, I'm somebody you've hired that doesn't want to do a big portion of their job. But he, anytime, because how that movie worked is we might do two lines, two takes by the script. And the rest was everybody just making up stuff that they went. So most of the time, what dominates my memory is the dinner table scene. It took us a week. And half of it was Will and Adam and John and Judd just yelling stuff at me and Houston to say. And if at any point it was – because Houston was 13 playing 10. He couldn't cuss enough. You, they gave him all my stuff. He was happy as a lark. And, um, but any time they were like, hey, say this, and it was remotely – the whole shoot would shut down. They're practically forming a little line coming up to me and my mother. 
to apologize for putting me in the situation that I was in. That's cool. And I mean, I've uh, the Wimpy Kid movies obviously were 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 great to me, um, but in in that capacity, Talladega Nights was probably the most professionally protective shoot I've ever been a part of. Yeah, see that okay, that gives me a different outlook on it too. As yeah. much respect as I have for some of those guys, because like I watch documentaries, I've just seen stuff about them. That makes me have a whole lot even more respect for them, though. Yeah. I wouldn't have figured yeah. that they'd have done that, but it just seems like to go along with the narrative of who they are. Yeah, yeah. They, I mean, I don't know who would have, you know, who'd have been, you know, terrible to it to a child, but um, but they were incredibly respectful of of you know of, of how I wanted to, of how I wanted to brand myself as a seven year old. Yeah, yeah. You know? Um, and I think my, my, I know my saving grace is, you know, as to not turning out just absolutely sideways outside of, you know, the, the good Lord and my parents was, and I've learned this as I've gotten a little older well, and I was mad, you know, as a child, because I, okay, you do this, you do child like I said, nobody expected me to do another movie, you know, like, ah, oh, so one off. Yeah. You know, why would Grace and Russell from Clanton, Alabama, whose mom's an accountant, dad's a contractor, his parents run the local T-shirt store. Why would, why would he be an actor? Like, why would he pursue a career in that? Why would that work for him? Yeah. You know, that doesn't make any sense. And uh, Michael Clark Duncan, the big black guy from the Green Mile. I love who that played, who, who played Who played Lucius the Pit Crew Chief yeah. in Child Egg Nights, um, set me up with his manager at the premiere. And that's how I was able to stay in it. That's how I ended up getting all the, the wimpy kid. How many, um, how many my did you do gra- those? Like three or four? We did, we did three of those. We did three wimpy kid movies. But I think my, my saving grace was, it was almost, it was kind of a backhanded compliment, really. After I did Talladega Nights, I didn't work for two years. And part of that was, those two years, I was offered just about every snot-nosed brat child role <laughs> in, in Western culture. Yeah. At that point in time, um, which is a compliment because evidently I did it well enough that everybody wanted me to, you know, play this role. The other half of it was, man, you know, I don't want to be known. And I know my parents certainly didn't want, you know, their child to be known as the kid who plays all the brats. So for two years, it was a, it was a lull of, of really figuring out how to audition in this space and, and, you know, turning down down stuff really um and i think i, I did a movie after that called the rainbow tribe which is arguably probably one of the best films i've ever done as a nine-year-old it was me and uh my buddy max burkholder who did a uh, parenthood he's in the show ted now um noah monk who went on to play gibby on icarly uh david james elliott from jag he was he was leading that film um so it was tally Knight's two years this movie the rainbow tribe and then another two years and then the wimpy kids and it was about five there was really six movies i did all right there in the ball. What I'm trying to say is I think the reason why um, everything halfway turned out all right for me in a, in a personal and a mental health space is because the work was inconsistent enough that I was able to come home. I went to public school. I graduated high school with kids. I went to preschool with when I was two. So there was immediately being humbled. <laughs> After this two month, you know, whatever, hoorah in Charlotte or LA or Vancouver or wherever we were at. Um, but also I wasn't able to to be in this, you know, whatever environment long enough that I was able to leverage it. Or it was like to go, it, oh well, I'm not yeah. It was almost like an accessory to you. It wasn't it wasn't yeah. who you were. Yeah, yeah, and and the thing is too, like nobody at home thought it was cool, and that bothered me for a little while. But but honestly, that was that I really think was my was my saving grace, is that it was just a normal normal thing. Oh, Grace, it'll be back in two months. Oh, Grace is back. You have a good time, sure. Sweet. Yeah, yeah. Roll on. I get that more than you realize. So, uh, I get humbled by a twelve year old every day. My daughter does not think that what her dad does is cool at all. 
she thinks that I am just, I don't know what the hell she thinks I do, but like, I'll go to Nashville like one week out of every month. And then I'm around, I have to host events throughout the month and places and all that kind of shit. And I'll get to be around artists and I'll get to be around like I'll get to call Will Mosley, you, Brian Martin, just a bunch of my buddies who have notoriety or whatever. I'll get to call you my buddies now and my friends and everything like that. Yeah. Jason Michael Carroll, who I grew up listening to his music and all this kind of stuff. Like these people are my friends. And I'll get in my head sometimes and it's like, I'm getting successful. I'm a badass and I should be proud of myself. And then I'll get home and my daughter will be like, you ain't shit. And I'll be like, <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, I can't impress a 12 year old yet. So I'm not shit. So yeah. bring that big yeah. inflated ego back. But it's good for you though. It does. Yeah. Like you yeah. keep saying, you keep saying my saving grace. So that's what I have a tattoo right here on my arm. My daughter's name is Gracie. Everything that I do is she's my saving grace. The name of our studio is raising grace, uh, raising right. grace studios. Uh, it stands for somewhere between raising grace, uh, somewhere between raising hell and amazing grace. Um, so like, I get it. It's you have to have that. You have to have something that not only humbles you, but reminds you, you got notoriety. You got popular. You got known for being who you are, not for who you became. And if you stay who you are, then you'll always be somebody who gets the notoriety. If you ever start thinking that you're the person that you became, then that's when that's when your head gets too big and nobody wants to be around you no yeah. more. You you stop getting jobs, you stop getting offers. Like it's just like nobody wants to be around that person. Yeah, well, dude, I'll tell you nothing. I couldn't imagine a, a, a worse scenario than being in a public school in Alabama in middle school and also playing Fregley at the same time. Oh my dude. god, you had to get shit, <laughs> dude. They were, like, that was brutal, brutal. Um, I wouldn't, you know, obviously there were, there were a, a lot of others who had a lot worse than me, but Lord, I wouldn't have wished that on, I wouldn't have wished that on anybody. I can um, imagine. But it did, it, it did, you know, it, it absolutely kept me up. But also to your friends, it, your it, actual yeah. friends had to be really proud of you. But at that age, they probably didn't know how to show it. So I guess oh, they're, they're, you don't have any, you don't have any concept for that. Yeah, you, you know, because it's like, well, how do you, it's apples and oranges. Like, how do you equate, you know, like my cousin, like my cousin Trey, he's one of my best friends who can smack a baseball. Yeah. You know, like, how do you, how do you equate that to acting? Kid? Yeah. Yeah. I get it. You know, like it's a different, it's a different thing altogether. Yeah. You know, and for me, it's like, man, I wish nothing more than Bill to hit a baseball like trade. Same. I you get know, because because that was because that was what to me was like, OK, that's what makes a difference to everybody. Yeah. I get, you know, and I, and I get blown away all the time when you get somebody in Nashville that'll like skinny, probably how he introduced me and you. Or how like a Bobby Pinson or somebody like that yeah. introduces me to somebody, so they'll know that hey, you should work with Josh. Is they'll say hey, Josh has got one of the top podcasts in the country. I have a top one percent show in the world. And when you yeah. get somebody like that that introduces me to somebody, and it's like, please don't introduce me like that. You've wrote a number one song. I don't, I'm not in the same ballpark as yeah. you in my mind, Yeah, but they think I'm successful. But for me, it's like, I'm not successful. I want to be able to write a number one song and sing. And yeah. I can't like, yeah. please, I don't even yeah. feel like I'm worthy to be in the room with you, dude. Like, yeah, please don't make that comparison, but it's, they do. And it's, 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 it's such apples and oranges. And I'm glad you get that because it is so yeah. hard for, for somebody like me. It's, it just does not add up or at least it doesn't feel like it adds up anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny. Like actors always want to be rock stars and rock stars always want to be actors. And so it's interesting to be in the middle of, of kind of both those worlds and trying to navigate it. Because for me, I, I had to, I, I started traveling doing gospel stuff and I was five, with my parents. And I, the first band I had was in the second grade and we sang solely Bee Gees. Um, did you say Bee Gees? Like when we were doing Talladega Nights. 
Bee Gees, yes. Oh my we're god, doing Talladega Nights. they got one of my favorite songs of all time. What is that? It's a slow song. Hank Williams Jr. covered it. Uh, what, to love somebody, yes, yeah, one of my favorite songs of all time. To love somebody is the most like covered song of all time. It's on Hank Jr.'s debut record. I love that. Um, song. like when you have when you have a song, so they wrote that for Otis Redding, so the guy who originally sings Hard to Handle, and um, he died before he could cut it, so they cut it. And you look at you don't talk about a friggin' a song. The song is covered by Hank Jr. on his solo record, Janis Joplin. I've never uh, heard Michael Blue Blade. Michael Blue Blade just cut it uh, in like maybe ten years ago. Uh, I mean, you you look through there because I'm going to record at some point, and I went through like every recording of it to see yeah. how we, what I want to be close to and where I wanted to land. I was like, my God, dude, it took me like three days worth of listening to the same song just to see who you know where everybody lands on it. This is a really cool story though. So I had this band in the second grade. We're doing nothing but Bee Gees music and Have a Nice Day by Bon Jovi. That was the only exception yeah. from that Red Smiley Face album. And Will Farrell and, and Adam McKay, who directed it, they would, we would be on set and they got a huge kick out. They would make up these long lost Bee Gees songs and sing them to me. Just pull them out of their butt. And the scene where uh, Ricky and Carly, so Will and his wife, Leslie, when they split, there's a deleted scene of us riding in the truck and I'm sitting on the bump singing How Deep Is Your Love. Oh shit! And and so fast forward fourteen years. You know, I led I led worship partner on staff for like nine years straight from high school up through my undergrad. And when I got when I got to Lee, which is which is where I did my undergrad, up was the first time I'm like, all right, I want to put a band together that's cool enough to play that's good enough to play Free Freebird. Uh, a month ago, we opened for a guy named Zach Williams for the show that ran like forty thousand people. After playing coffee shops and frat parties. And everything else. So 14 years removed from Will and Adam making up these long lost BG songs. We're playing a show at a, at a farm that Johnny Cash used to own out in Dixon. And we play it and everything gets done. And it's a pretty good show. And a dude comes up out of the audience. He says, hey, man, you've never met me before. You don't know who I am. But my name's Scott Glacial and I mixed four albums for the BGs. And I want to do all your stuff. I want to produce your stuff, whatever I can do to help. I believe in what you're doing. And, uh, of course, I'm floored because it's like, okay, well, Lord, this is absolutely all, all God here. And about two weeks later, I'm sitting in his house. His wife's cooking steaks. And he looks over at me. Fourteen years after Will and Adam said, hey, you want to hear Never Before Her Bee Gees song? Scott looks at me. He goes, hey, man, you want to hear Never Before Her Bee Gees song? Oh, man. And proceeds to play me. Two albums worth of things that they never released. Dude. And their demos from sitting in Morris's basement in Miami. I'm hearing scratch vocals of, of songs that I've only ever heard that were freaking hits. And you hear how the demo is totally different from what it was by the time they cut it. I walked outside in the yard, called my mom and bawled like a child, dude. Because that was just like such a full circle thing for me. So he goes, hey, man, I, you know, I want to record. I want to I want to do all your stuff. I said, yes, sir. And a year and a half after that, we get ready to cut our record, which is which now, yeah, it's all Southern Rock stuff, at Mercy Me's studio, which is the house they bought from Motley Crue. The first song I ever learned to sing in my life. I was three years old, dressed up like George Strait, sitting in front of church singing, I can only imagine. So here we are cutting our first record in the Imagine House, which was a song built off the re uh, a studio oh. built off the revenue of the first song I ever learned how to sing. A month before we go in to cut it, Scott has a massive heart attack and dies. Oh man! So here I am trying to trying to go into this, not blind, but certainly without the the man I really wanted to lean on. You know, yeah. because the BGs, the BGs and George Strait absolutely shape. You know, my sonic taste and the biggest influences, you know, musically on me for sure. And here I am getting to go in the studio with the man who put them on tape for four albums, you know, and now he's no longer here. And I, and I didn't know what to do. And by the grace of God, come to find out, Houston, who played my brother in childhood, he passed away a couple of years ago. His sister is my age. 
got a degree in audio engineering from Belmont and works as an engineer for Universal at freaking East Iris on Music Row. And she's like, oh, yeah, dude, I got you. So here's the Talladega Nights reunion. And she ran the board for the whole album. Her and my buddy Luke Mercer. And it's just like so many. I know that was a long story, but so nice. many like Bee Gees, Bee Gees. I can only imagine. Mercy me. Talladega Nights. Coming back into, into play in all of this, man. And it's, uh, I, you know, I have been so incredibly blessed to do the things that I've done. Um, and had no, uh, no, oh my gosh. Sorry. Did that just no, look out? Good. Somebody called me and said, no, okay, good. Good. it's fine. Um, and I had no, uh, you know, even now I had no concept of what Talladega Nights would mean. Just as how I, you know, go about, you know, my daily life, not realizing that, gosh, 18 years after that film came out, that it's that it's still relevant. Yeah. That I'm that I'm able to, you know, that there's even a, a coattail to ride for me going into this music stuff that's all, that's also my own. Even though you know my, my the the music side of my life hasn't been recognized to the extent Talladega Nights has. Um, that's that's okay. Um, but for me now, it's I studied a lot of how Hank Jr. Um, I didn't really have to study. I've grown up listening to him a whole lot. But how okay? How do you enter into an industry? And with in the shadow of somebody like Hank Senior, yeah, and one of my best one of my best friends here is 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 Sam Williams. Oh, I love Sam. Son. Um, Sam's precious. Um, one of the things I wanted to really look into was like, okay, how do how do I go about navigating the music industry in a way that I can acknowledge that films absolutely brought me to the dance. Yeah, I, I can't. I can't not acknowledge that. Yeah. Um, but how do I do it in a way that, you know, doesn't, you know, take away from what I'm trying to do and say, you just don't, I'm doing. you just don't make it your whole persona. There's, there's, yeah. that's it. I mean, you got to tip your hat to it. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that want to take something like that and they want to make it their whole spiel, their whole gimmick. And that can't be it. Like you, you have to be so much more. And there's too many people that'll like take one thing that's happened to them or one song. Like uh, one of our good friends is is Trey Lewis, and Trey yeah. Lewis, and I, I love Trey to death, and I love him for a lot of reasons. But one of the things that I really just respect so much about him is he refuses to be known as the Dick Down in Dallas guy. He does not yeah. want to be known and he shouldn't be known as that. Cause he's got a lot of great music, right? And he's going to play the song, but he did this show one time and he told me a story. Uh, do you know who Corey Smith is? Yes. Okay. Corey Smith has several songs that, especially down here in Georgia, people acknowledge as like party songs, but one's called fuck the popo. And that's a song that he plays and he gets the people going with it every time. But he Trey tells a story on this show that that he had a conversation with. Uh, does, does Corey do the the wishing I was twenty one? Yep, yep. Wishing that's I was dude. That song's a yeah. freaking heater. Man. Yeah. So then that might be another one that he told Trey about too. But he's like, look, you got to pay homage to these songs. You have to play them, but you have to play your new stuff too. You can't just. You always have got to appreciate these songs because these songs is what brought people to you. But you're not that person. You're not just those songs. So it would be like the same thing with you. It'd be like, yeah, people might have got your attention, or you might have got their attention because of Talladega Nights. But that's not what's going to keep them around. Same thing when I said at the beginning of the show is, yeah, you got my attention because I was 18 years old or whatever when that movie came out or a little bit younger. But the second I heard you play a song, you got my respect. Like you, it wasn't like you were just, oh, I was the kid from Talladega Nights and Diary of a Wimpy Kid, and now I'm trying my hand at music. It's like, no, you're actually good at this. And then you get around you, and you hear you talk about your faith, and you hear you talk about how much you love George Strait and everything else that goes along with it. You use it to get your foot in the door, but the fact that you don't really even bring it up, it's not like you're using it as a crutch. 
or anything like that. Like you're, you're getting by on your own merit of who you are now, not who you were then. And that's what people love and probably respect about you so much. It's like, Hey, that's just a chapter in your book. That's not your whole book. A lot of people yeah. want to make the cool thing they did in their life, their whole story. That's not what you're doing. Like even with Sam, me and Sam had a, he played my show a couple months ago and it's one of the coolest moments of my life. Like I had him, Brian Martin and Ben Roberts on stage at the same time. And I had to ask yeah, beforehand, awesome. I had to ask them beforehand. I was like, Hey, cause I don't know if you've ever heard Sam's version of weatherman, but he blows his dad's version out the fucking water. And I love Hank senior. And, but I asked him yeah. beforehand, I was like, Hey, look, I don't want you to do this unless you want to do it because I actually like your music. And that's why I'm asking you to do the show because I like your music, but I always try to end the show on something that's going to be like a moment for the show. And I yeah, know freaking skinny doing Meredith. Yeah. Jesus. Doing, yeah. He kills Meredith. Jesus. And so they were like, yeah, we'll do, it, we'll do it because of that. And they killed it. But after that, yeah. that night, I remember being at red door and shit face talking to Sam. And like, I can't wait to have a one-on-one -on -one podcast with him like this, but him just telling me a lot of stuff. And it's the same thing with him. It's like, yeah, he might be Hank Jr.'s son, but he's not trying to get by being Hank Jr.'s son. He's trying to get by being Sam Williams. And I respect yeah. that about people like you, people like him. There's a lot of other people that's in Nashville that you don't need a gimmick. You're good as you are now. You don't need one thing that happened in your life or a last name to make you who you are. Yes, sir. Well, I appreciate that very much. You're welcome. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have you on the show if it was just you were the kid from Talladega Nights, bro. I'm an <laughs> asshole. <laughs> I, I, I'd have took a picture with you. I'd have, you know, that'd have been about it. I'm telling you, like with me, you have to have depth. You have to have something that I to offer more than a gimmick. I don't do the gimmicky. I, with, with TikTok and everything else and Instagram. I could get social media influencers on here all day, every day, just to run their mouths and grow my numbers. But yeah. that, that don't do nothing for me. And that, yeah. and the people that I want listening to this show, if that's what they want to listen to, I don't want them on the show. I don't want them to listen to me. I want, I want people that's going to have real conversations and talk about real shit and, yeah. and people that they actually should go listen to and dive into. Yes, sir. Yeah. What what's some stuff you got coming up? Man, I'm doing whiskey jam on the fifth. That's of cool. Of September? I mean, I'm excited about that. Fifth of September. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the thing for me is is coming in here. I knew like, okay, well, all our songs are gonna start dropping September, October, November. It's like I know, you know, all right, people, you know, perception is reality artist, the movie kid who's now doing music, even though I'm still doing film. Like, man, I wanna be sure I, I come up through here in the right in the right way, in the right yep. order. So for me, like playing Nashville Pals, playing Live Oak, doing the local, doing Greenlight, doing Whiskey Jam, those were the things for me. It's like, okay, I want to be sure if I can, to the best of my ability, do all of these venues um, before I leave to go do season two of my TV show. So I'm going to show right now called Blue Ridge, and then we'll start season two, like the back end of September. Are you going to be and in so town? Getting to, are you going to be in town September the 11th? Yeah, yeah, I'm playing. I'm actually I'm playing at Losers okay. September. The oh, that's 11th. right. I've already asked you, hadn't I, to play my show? Yes, September now are you, are you? Yeah, but yeah, because I can come. I can come okay. do because my band will be in town. We can come do one and go around and do the other. Cool. Let's do. But that. um, but uh, yeah. So I mean, that's just things that are you know places that are really important to play for me. Because I was talking to Hasten uh, about it, which Hasten's owner of Live Oak. You guys who don't know Hyson, he's the man. The man. And he is the man. Uh, just talking about, you know, okay, Live Oak and somewhere like Whiskey Jam carries the weight of what, you know, in my mind, Tootsie's and Whiskey Jam are to Luke Combs and Jelly Roll and, and Laney Wilson and, and the crew that's absolutely running the show now. Live Oak is to them as what Tootsie's or Roberts would have been to 
Hank Senior, Toby Keith, you know, the the crew coming through there. And so it was just very important um, to me to 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 work up to getting able to play those places. Yeah. Um, and they're really, really special to get to because it's funny because my folks came to the first round at Live Oak and to them it wasn't a big deal. You know, because it's because, you know, well, you've done a movie, got nominated for an Oscar and you, you're you going to play a show for 40,000 people in a couple of weeks. You know, like, how does this <clears throat> compare? And for me, with acting, there was never really, I mean, there is not a, a, a really a grindstone to have your nose to. Yeah. You know, like, they're, like, I can work out, I can learn another accent, I can learn a cool skill maybe, but there's not a lot of asses to have my head up, you know, like there is here. Yeah. There, there, here is, you can always be writing, you can always be playing, you can always be somewhere with somebody learning something because the landscape is ever changing. Yeah. And so to be able to come into town and work up to a, to a, a level of of respect and acceptance as a as a songwriter and as a performer, to be able to hop into Live Oak and get to play it three times, which I know to some people it's like there's there's people I've ever played Live Oak ninety times, but for me to get in hop in to play it three times right before it it changes locations. Yeah, getting getting to play Whiskey Jam right before getting and going doing. Uh, you know, this TV show that meant that means the world to me. That means the absolute world to me because it's people that, that are, that, that have shown me grace. You're one of those individuals. Let me get to come up there and play your round. The not for ask me to do that for you ever heard me actually play the round skinny. Um, people who, who have, who have given me room, um, and, and given me grace to, to get up, and and perform and, and play things that are very near and dear to my heart. Because when I'm acting, I get to be somebody else. I get to study what this person likes. When I get to play Dwayne Dixon, who's the village idiot on Blue Ridge the series, <laughs> I've got, you know, I'm listening to Two Dozen Roses and I've got Alabama and freaking like Black Snake, like like old school Southern Rock yeah. stuff, Molly Hatchet. You know, that's a different not I like listening to that stuff anyway, so that's easy. When I'm doing Greyhound which was the Tom Hanks movie I got to do. Um, the World War II Navy film. We got nominated for an Oscar in 2021 by the grace of God. Um, you know, all right, well, what does he do? Well, well, he's got a sister named Edith, and his dad works for Paul Mall Cigarettes, and his favorite song is In the Pines. Um, and, you know, you have all these things that are, that are separate from who you are. As a but I couldn't be more thankful and more grateful for the individuals who've allowed me to get up on a stage here and be myself when it, when it did nothing for them, when it was purely out of, out of just being a, a kind individual and grace and saying, Hey, yeah, sure, man, I'll give you it. I'll give you a shot to come up here. Well, um, well, I just think, putting, putting their name on the line. I really appreciate that. Well, that I, doesn't think go up. I think I that people, I, I don't think that people that aren't, that don't have that poet or that songwriter mentality are ever going to get what those places mean. Like what yeah. they actually mean to us, because like I, like I just know the first time Will Mosley played a song that me and him and Nate Baker wrote together up there. The first time that Riley Anderson played a song that I wrote up there. The first time that anybody else has played a song that I've wrote with them up there. Like it's just, it means something. And I can sit here all day. And that's one reason why we record those and put them out. So people can hear them like all over the place, like as episodes, because people around here, unless you go up there and you're there all the time, you don't understand what those writers rounds mean to people like you, me, and everybody that's on those stages. There's something that's yeah. special that happens every once in a while up there. And it, maybe it's not that you hear the best song or whatever, but maybe you get to see somebody like you that's playing it for the first time and you get to see what it means to them because it is yeah. like a tip of the hat. Like if you play something good and somebody the, the sitting on stage with you or somebody sitting in front of you, somebody that you admire is like, that's a good song. It, and you get to see their reaction to your song. It's like, 
that gives you positive reinforcement. It's like, I'm doing what I'm yeah. supposed to. Yeah. It's confirmation. And then, yeah. I mean, even, even then, okay. So, so I played the round with skinny and then I played your round with, and, and I believe Courtney was on, on that round, Courtney Taylor. And then she, you know, respected what I was doing enough to have me on, on her round a couple of weeks yeah. later. That meant the world. Because not only are we just having a good time and people out in the audience, you know, might like it, they might clap whether they halfway paid attention or not. But the individuals that you're up here that are your peers going, Hey man, I really like your stuff. Will you come and play? Will you come and play over here with me? Um, and that's um, be hard pressed to find a greater, uh, a greater compliment. Um, the thing that means deeper in in the space that I'm in now that having, you know, a jury of my peers <laughs> go, Hey, come play with us. We want you to come over here, you know, because it's the, because it's the other side of, man, I just want to be able to hit a ball like Trey. Yeah, dude. I want to have, I want to have them say, Hey, can we, you want to come over here and play with us? Because I could, I, I wasn't any good. And also I, I it was a ball. I really couldn't do because I couldn't get hurt. Because we were doing Wimpy Kid every August, October. And if I got hurt in spring training in April, I wouldn't be able to work <laughs> in Vancouver, British Columbia for three months, you know, August, October, um, which sometimes is hard for a middle schooler to get through their head. But it's, for me, it's, it's the same. It's the same feeling, man. They yeah. respect my abilities enough as a, as a writer, which is so much more intimate. And so much so more vulnerable much. Um, than 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 anything argue I've ever I've I've really ever done. I, I did a I worked with so many actors that I, I decided to get a I got a master's in clinical mental health counseling because I wanted to know what the hell I was doing. And not that I ain't gonna lean on the good Lord and the Holy Spirit as much as I can, but I just want to know what was what was going on. And uh, and for me, I, I, I work uh, I do some work with a with a nonprofit called Creative Ed's. Um, oh, I love Creative Ed's. We write songs. Yeah, I love yeah dude. Events. So I was I was with I was with Brett up in uh, Utah. Okay. Uh, this week doing that. So the part of the reason why I was running crazy this morning is because I had to I had to cut a work tape for a song um, we wrote and just just to be able to to for me I had to sit in seven hundred hours worth of counseling sessions for my masters to sit in those situations and then to turn that around and go okay I'm in a very similar spot with this veteran here in Park City Utah but we get to write a song out of it. It's a counseling yeah. session, but I get to have a guitar in my hand and we get to talk about, you know, how uh, the, the, the course for this last one is, um, living somebody else's life, just trying to get out of my, uh, a uniform and a pair of M frames, sunglasses, something I could hide behind. There's a picture on the mantle left up there to remind me of the man I was and the life I left behind, which is uh, about my, my buddy that I met up there who um, was laying in bed one night and he, his wife found his, his basic training picture and put it on the mantle. He wanted to halfway snatch it off the wall and break it because that's not who he is. Anymore. Yeah. And he's worked for the past 30 years of his life to not be that person, anymore. not be that person to not be the person that, that he left behind. And how do you, how do you take the story of this man um, sitting there just bawling his eyes out, talking about this, that, or the other. And then, you know, everybody gets their composure and here comes his chorus. And you watch that man shed a couple of tears and go, yep, that's right. And then you move on and you realize that, okay, we're, I'm able to combine the, the, the counseling aspect and then the listening to, to someone's heart and trying to help. But then taking that in a way and put it into a song, which is the way I get through my stuff. Because it's no different than I got a buddy who's ninety something who delivered like three thousand babies in our little hometown. That was his job. He was a doctor, and he said having a child is the only thing that you go into in a hospital and you come out with something. Like you come out with something great you didn't have. And I feel the same way about songwriting, in that it's one of the few things that I can do in my life where I go through this relative level of hell, whether it's a relationship, whether it's somebody died, whether I'm in a bind or I've done something I shouldn't have. 
and the way I can handle it is not by going out and doing this, that, or the other. It's probably also detrimental. But I can sit here and I can I can put it to song in a way that I benefit from it. And then you turn around a year or two later and you get up and you play it and you watch people's eyes Oof. just start bawling and you go, okay, the good Lord's got a bigger purpose for this song. That's why there's a song that I wrote that day I couldn't be more prouder of. This is what you've heard me play a couple of times. It's called Turned Out Good. It's my, oh, yeah. My granddad, my granddad lost his mom when he was three. She got melanoma picking cotton and fell dead. He got rheumatic fever paralyzing from the waist down. They took him to a church service and he took off running. My dad was was abused as a child, and his his mother left when he was uh, when he was little, and his dad beat the fire out of him. And to be able to get up and and sing how the good Lord's changed these people's lives, and the only reason I am the way I am is because of the lives that these men have, and the women as well. But I'm able to take that song, and when we're playing opening for Zach Williams in Oshkosh for a blue million people, I'm able to sing that after playing Skinner or whatever. And then I'm able to bring up my dad, who is the second verse of this song. Yeah. And have him come up, who can sing circles around me. And we'll sing, I can only imagine. Mm. He showed me how to do it when I was three years old. And you watch people just absolutely melt and go, well, not only are we singing about something that has happened in my life, but here's the evidence of whether your mother died when you were a child or you're terminally ill or your mother left and your dad beat you. He was a belligerent drunk, or you were abused by the only person who was ever supposed to take care of you. That can end with you. That can end today. And the good Lord is the only common denominator in that, in those two individuals' lives. And here's the evidence. And we get done like playing our stuff that's all, you know, living in women is what we call it. And playing Skinner, we might end with Simple Men or Free Bird or whatever. Who cares? And when we get done, there will be as big of a line, if not bigger, of a hairy, hairy, burly, 40-year-old men that are bawling their eyes out to beat my dad. There will be a bigger line to meet him than there will be a 13-year-old kids or 40-year-old dudes going, oh, man, you played Fregley or Tal Daganot, so we love this, that, <laughs> or the other. And that's how we know that, you know what, that's, it's doing that's something. making a difference. It's doing what it's supposed to. That's doing something. It's doing what it's supposed to. The, one of the coolest things that's happened to me since I've been in town is um, one of my dad's favorite songs when I was growing up was uh, Trent Thomas saying Angel with No Halo. Oh, on. God. I, every time I get around and, Trent, I have to tell him what that song means to me. Yeah. And there are very few CDs I remember my folks buying. Yeah. I think the only two CDs I remember my dad having was the One Wing in the Fire CD with Trent on a motorcycle with the mm -hmm. band down. Yep. And the Bee Gees number ones that I stole from. Those are the only two I really remember him having around. And uh, there was one called Skinner, uh, Skinner Friends, but that's irrelevant. And uh, <laughs> I remember hanging out, oh, I don't know, maybe a month ago. Ended up running into Trent Thomas. And I was, and I, you know, I was able to maybe explain a little bit to him, you know, what that song meant to me and what that song meant to my dad. And then about a week later, we were hanging out. I run into him. He said, hey, man, come over to the house. We're going to have a glass of wine. Just hang out. Well, it ended up just being me and him. So here I am sitting at the house with this dude who wrote my dad's favorite song. That's a song about Trent's relationship with his dad. About six o'clock rolled around, and I'm able to sing Turned Out Good, which is the song that I wrote about my dad. To the dude that, you know, whose song meant the world to my own father. And that song's about his dad. Yeah. And that was just, that's one of the coolest things I have. I kept a bottle of wine <laughs> kind of would, up there on the shelf. I would have to. And, uh, yeah, you know, because it's just it's things that mean the world to me. Um, and just to be able to be so blessed and so fortunate, because it's all the good, Lord, that, you know, I'm getting to spend time around. Um, not, just, not just my heroes. I'll get to that point. I hope, but getting to spend time with the individuals who, whose lives and whose projects shaped my parents, it inadvertently turned around and 
had an effect on me. Yeah. You know, getting, getting to, getting to just be in the presence of these individuals is, um, well, you're, you're solely responsible I, for one I, of the, I can't take that for granted. Well, you're solely responsible for one of the absolute coolest moments of my life. Like <laughs> one of the, everybody knows that Lonesome Dove is my thing. It is my favorite. Yeah. Every thing when it comes to books and movies of all time. And let me tell you something, dude. I don't remember getting as giggly as whatever. I've got, I think I've fangirled out three times now in my life. And one was Vince Gill. I almost killed him on a golf course. One was Aaron Lewis getting to hang out at his house not long ago. And then when you brought DB Sweeney, old Dish Boggett, yeah, over to Live Oak to meet me. But it's like, you're the same way skinny is man. You're just, you're such a good, wholesome person that when you get around these people, they just fall in love with you. Like you're, you're going to gravitate. People are going to gravitate towards you to where like, Hey, good things are just going to keep happening to you. And you just, you, you're not one of those that keeps those things to yourselves. Like you, you spread them out and that's what you're supposed to do. Like, so you bring in dish or DB Sweeney. To, to meet me, it was the coolest shit to me. I just, I can't tell you how much I appreciate, appreciate it. And something that I'm trying to learn now is I think that if you keep doing those kind of things, the good things that you want to happen to you are going to happen to you. And I wish everybody was like that. Like it's almost like the paying it forward shit. Like if you, yeah. if you're doing to others, what you want done to you, it's going to happen. I mean, you're not supposed to do it because you want it to happen. You do it because it feels good. You're, we're supposed to be givers, not takers anyway. And I'm telling you, dude, I'll, I'll remember that shit. I was, I still light up that I, I, I want to have him on the show so bad, but I, I'm scared that I will do nothing. But be like, just tell me about some stuff. Just talk to me for four hours. Oh no. Yeah, he would, he would love that because I would, it's funny because I, I, I kind of addressed DB for the first first few times I met him. He's one of my best friends now. Um, I, I I would kind of approach him about Lonson Dub the same way a lot of people approach me about Talladega Nights. Like, yeah. oh, I bet he hates talking about it because he's talking about it his whole life. And it, it couldn't be more wrong. Talladega Nights did shape the life that I have, man. Yeah. And, to, and to see the joy that comes off of people's faces – from something that I did as a seven year old, yeah. will I be able to top it ever? Maybe I doubt it. Oh, you definitely. But will. here's the you thing: definitely I've will. been able, I've been able, I've been able to hit a, a, a degree of success with Talladega Nights and Wimpy Kid and the Oscar Nod that Greyhound got. That if I get smoked by the friggin' drunk ass pedal trolley on Demumbrian, dude, I've been able to hit that level. And my folks still be around to see me do it. My grandparents still be around to see me do it. I'm not Morgan Freeman's age being 60 and hitting driving Miss Daisy and just then breaking <laughs> through it. And all the people that have supported you, you know, up to this point aren't around to see it. Dude, I, I got my money's worth. And I know DB's a, the, the same way with Lonesome Dove in that he loves talking about it because that's something that, that means – so much to everybody else and it's not a, it's not really a, a fad you know i mean and that was the thing for me was like i watch that show once if not twice a year i want and anytime anybody like pitches pitches like a western to me or it's like dude i'm writing this new western script the first thing i say is have you ever watched something Duck? and half the time they're young guys and they're like no i hadn't i'm like well look you don't do a World War II film without watching Save It Private Ryan. You don't do a World War II film without watching Band of Brothers. Yep. You can't do a Western without watching Lonesome Dove. It's the standard for for how this should go. It's the standard for how you should you should you should portray two dudes who have done this their whole life. You'd yep. be hard pressed to find banter that is any better. Yeah, there's not. Than the, Open and seen come in there when they're I, when they're friggin' eating breakfast and lonesome dove. I'd even say and to me that's the model for 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 anything I write. I'd even side, say sure. this. This is always like how I get a woman to watch lonesome dove with me. By the way, 
And there's yet to be one that's really loved it, by the way, because, and that's probably why I've never been married. But I also think yeah. Lonesome Dove is like one of the best love stories of all time. I I really yeah. do think that the way Gus McRae feels for Clara is one of the best. Yeah. When, when he's by that fucking creek and he's crying and he's like, whatever you pitch it or the happiest moment of your life is, or what do you think heaven is? Or I can't remember how he says it word for word, but he's like, it's right here. And it was me and Claire picnicking. And then he's crying. And then Woodrow's behind him. And he's like, well, you always got your horse. Like you always, always got your horse. You always got your yeah. horse. I'm telling you, there's not a better love story. There's not a better bromance. There's like buddy comedy as I know it's not a comedy, but there's lines in that throughout the whole thing it's like i can't think of a better written anything like there's a couple movies yeah. that i'd almost put up that it's like i'm a big brave heart guy i love brave heart i love forrest gump yeah like i think that they're amazingly well written like stuff like that but i just there's lonesome dove to me is the tip of the hat to damn near everything dude for me it's it's lord of the rings that's so great i saw that i was four changed my life Lord of the Rings, Sling Blade. Oh, Sling Blade's always going to be great. And 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 Lonesome Dove. It's yeah. like those. Yeah. <laughs> and Band of Brothers. It's like, all right, cool. Those are the things that I will watch, you know, throughout the year once or twice. Yeah. You know, like I travel I travel with a little box of movies everywhere that, you know, and I go to live somewhere else. I travel with, with one or two little boxes. And it's, I've got the, I've got the, Box set Lonesome Dove that was my dad's. Oh, my yeah. dad's. I told from him. Um, I travel with Lonesome Dove. I travel with Secondhand Lions. A great um, movie. Great. Uh, um, Blazing Saddles. Great. Naked Gun. Um, Aliens. Predator. And Lord of the Rings. This is and that's it, kind of in my little in my little box, and that's and that's what I take. This is and so I wish hard. I had Sling Blade, but I don't have it on a DVD. It's just so hard to beat Robert Duvall anyway to me. Like he's just I yeah, I have yeah. to make people watch The Apostle all the time. Like I love yeah. the Apostle so one for the road, Rodney. Boy, <laughs> when he hits Ow. old man, when he hits old dude with that bat, oh my god. And like one of my favorite parts in that movie is when he's in the bedroom before he decides to go on his his quest or his mission, whatever, and he's screaming at God. Yeah. And it's just like if he put Robert Duvall is just the shit to me. Like I just I can't I cannot stress enough. I might cry the day yeah. he dies. I really as much as I love oh, us. Oh, I I hundred percent will because he was the only uh he was the only person I really once I realized like oh I'm supposed to be an actor. That's one of the things I'm supposed to do in this life. He was one of the, he was really the one of the few people that I was like oh man I really want to work with Robert Duvall. Like uh, Tom Hanks was somebody I never even dreamed. Never even dreamed of getting to work with, and he's easily the the most kind and humble and, and the least intimidating individual I've ever. He's a big Talladega Nights fan too, which was a whole other trip for me. Um, I would have not figured but, that uh, at all. Yeah, yeah. Tom is precious. Tom is Tom. Tom, Tom is a is a um, a contemporary spirit with with somebody like Austin Post. Yeah. He's it's got just, he's got some of my favorite movies too, though. Tom Hanks is one of those that he's oh. just. I mean, Forrest Gump's always going to be the pinnacle. I mean, it's just, it's yeah. so hard to beat Forrest Gump too. But also, I've ruined that movie for myself because I can't watch it without talking and quoting it the whole time. Nobody wants to watch it with me. I don't want to watch it with myself anymore. I can't. I can't enjoy it. Like I, I said, I quote. Uh, do, do you have the? Uh... The the John Anderson the John Anderson song the be good to my dogs yes yeah. my children to pray <laughs> yeah well not not swing but that song particularly every time I listen to it I feel like that's what Horace Gump was like oh oh yeah shit I never thought of that you might have just <laughs> ruined that song man. for me you might <laughs> no, have but I, and I love I love I love John Anderson I do too uh, but that sounds it my children to pray uh, but God and and when I was talking to Tom. Of course, it's been a few years ago, and somebody asked him, you know, like, what what role would you keep if you had to get rid of all of them? What one would you keep? He's like, I'd have to, I'd have to keep Little Forest. He's like, that's the one I have to do. And 9-11 screwed up them doing the sequel. 
which they were gonna really do a sequel pissed to me Forrest off. Gump. They were going to do a sequel, and Forrest Gump was going to be dancing with Princess Diana at a ball. Oh, my God. And he was going to be in the back of the Bronco with OJ and Marcus Allen. And I was like, oh. On top of on top of the significance of 911, you look at like because you can you can see sometimes how like historical events has has shaped the music that got released or or the films that were supposed to come out yeah but that didn't because this event happened or 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 this thing happened I can't remember some of the uh there was a song I was I was um I think I was talking to Trent Tomlinson about and it ended up that it didn't um. I could be wrong that it didn't do any better than it did because um, some big some big event had happened and it touched on something that's similar. Yeah. Um, but I can't remember where I went when I heard that. That was a couple of the things that were going to be, and there was some some other stuff that was cool. But just thinking like, man, what I would give to see Forrest Gump in the back seat of that white Bronco going down the <laughs> going down the highway with the OJ. I can't. I I, I you, that's. I don't know if I don't. I mean, I know I would have watched it, but just hearing that, it's just like, no, <laughs> please, please don't, Forrest. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> shit. Well, du- well, dude, uh, I, I know I want to do another one of these with you in a group setting. Um, so I'm probably gonna cut it yeah. at this. But when we're in Nashville that week for my birthday, I know we're gonna record a group show at live oak one day before they open and i would love to have you be part of it when we get closer to time i'll be there because i know that i know we sit here and do this all day especially start talking about movies um but i want you to know dude like it's been a pleasure meeting you so far and i thank the damn world of you i know everybody we've been around so far thanks the world of you and i can't wait to hear some more of your music and uh, i look forward to you playing the show september the 11th for my birthday and our two-year anniversary too and uh man, it's just this has been a pleasure, dude. You're a good one. You're you're one of the good ones. Yes, sir. Thank you, Josh. I really appreciate that, man. Well, drop your y'all social- be good. And hey, whoever's out there, yeah. Drop yeah, your social- I got you. I'm plugging. We're social- already moving. So plug your, plug your social media real fast. We'll get the hell out of here. If uh if y'all wouldn't mind following me, man, that's better than 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 tips when you play a show, dude. If y'all if y'all would follow me at Grayson C. Russell, G-R-A-Y-S-O-N C. R U S S E L L. You can hear all my stuff there. I got a website, Grayson Russell Online. Y'all come holler at me, man. I try to, uh, I try to be in those comments. Y'all let me know what you want to hear. I'm doing a whole thing now where I'm actually going through my Talladega Night scrapbook and my Wimpy Kids scrapbook and just going through whatever. And people are dropping stuff they have in the comments, which is really cool. And so we'll go back and answer them. But um, and then my music stuff too, please, because that's a, that's a whole other side of my life. Hell yeah, dude. Josh, thank you. Anytime, um, brother. And thank you for having me on uh, on on your show last month because that meant the absolute world to me get to do that. Well, really I want you to know, I'll never forget it. Well, I want you to know it meant just as much to me to have you there. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Thank man. you. Well, thank each and every one of y'all for hey, listening. Y'all be good. Thank each and every one of y'all for listening to Josh Terry Podcast. Check out my boy, Grayson Russell, and I will see y'all next time. <laughs>